Welcome to Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. In the next half hour, you'll obtain insights and tools to transform your life using the biblical principles found in the 12-step program. We believe everyone can benefit from a life recovery experience because we all have struggles in life. Struggles with addictions, food, depression, anxiety, and relationships to name a few. You'll be encouraged to see how others have found a new way of life with hope for the future through life recovery. Your host is Steve Arterburn, founder of New Life Ministries and Women of Faith, author of over 100 books, and a sought-after speaker and teacher. Steve is the co-editor of the Life Recovery Bible, the number one selling recovery Bible. With over 3 million copies sold, this is the Bible given to inmates by Prison Fellowship and the Pew Bible for the Salvation Army. Now here's Steve. Hi there. Welcome to Life Recovery Today. Steve Arterburn here. And I'm really glad that you've joined us for, well, it's the first of four different uh, episodes on relapse and relapse prevention. Now, you may have heard this phrase, plan your work and then work your plan. Well, this saying, it really works in recovery. When you approach a recovery plan or a strategy for growth and transformation, well, we, we don't fall into the rationalizations that can derail the recovery because our plan is based on the truth that's the foundation of all those 12 steps. So, we're looking at what is it that helps us the most prevent relapse. Because relapse isn't an event, it's a process. Here's what I had to say about relapse. Today, I want to talk to you about developing or helping a person develop a comprehensive recovery plan. Now, you know, a recovery plan is a, it, well, it's a protection plan. And it really is the thing that if it works, is going to keep this person growing, moving forward. It's also going to help them to uh, know what to do when they get in trouble, triggered or tempted, whatever. Um, but a lot of people, I'm, I'm kind of astounded that folks can go into a treatment program and come out of that program and they don't have a plan. In this relapse protection program, which is really what we're trying to do, if, I, if we can prevent relapse, and I'm going to do a whole segment on the stages of relapse and what we need to do about it, but um, all of this is not going to take place if I'm a person uh, who is still rationalizing the situation in my life. So after uh, treatment or let's say after a person stops doing whatever it is that they were doing, the rationalization can just really come right back in with things like, hey, I, I quit or uh, hey, we got that taken care of or I'm strong. I've got this. All those are rationalizations that prevent a person from continuing to do what is going to be healthy for them. And so many times as a coach, in the beginning, I need to look at and help a person um, uncover the rationalizations that might be preventing them from developing a plan, a blueprint for the future that could help them uh, grow help them have structure that they need, and then keep them out of trouble and, and relapse. What I'm dealing with here is I'm giving them reality. And if they can't accept that reality, then we're already in trouble. So I want to be uh, very upfront with that a lot of really strong people that had a really great reputation uh, messed up because they didn't fully see the reality. Now, in the Christian world, sometimes we see people who say, I was delivered from this problem, and I don't really need to do anything else uh, because of it. And here's the thing. There are people that are absolutely um, delivered from an addiction. In other words, they wake up one morning or, they, or afternoon, and they don't have an urge or a craving anymore for that substance. What a gift that is. 
And, and what do we need to do with that gift? Uh, well, a lot of people use it as a, a source of spiritual superiority. Hey, listen, God healed me from that. God delivered me from that. Okay, here's the deal. I've never met any person who was ever delivered into spiritual maturity. Never seen anybody that was delivered out of a thing to instantly have full-on biblical character or godly character. So a person that was delivered, here's the thing. They've been given a gift that they don't have to every day uh, worry about the cravings that are still there. Wow, they were given a gift by God. The cravings aren't there, and now they can work even harder with less distraction of the cravings, and we need to act on that gift, not act like that fixes everything. Here's the other thing. I've never seen a person that was delivered from something. I've never seen their family instantly delivered from resentment, bitterness, anger, and all the other things that impacted them because of the problem. So when I have a plan, it's going to be realistic. And no matter how I got here, I need a plan. Nobody gets off without a plan. And a lot of people are really messed up because they never had a plan. And that plan needs to include my family. Let's just say my family is my spouse. That's the only family that I have. Over and over again, we see uh, the couples start to separate after recovery begins. For instance, here's a guy over here using pornography, sleeping with prostitutes, total sex addict, gets help, maybe he goes to every man's battle, gets help, and now he is living with sexual integrity. And people are saying things like, wow, what a change you've made. You are amazing. You look so good. Man, life seems to be going well. And here the spouse is <laughs> over there, and uh, she's had to live with this, and she doesn't even know how long this is going to last. And we have to, we have to have a plan that considers that, that considers her hurt and just the disparity and, and the, the dilemma of her feeling hurt while I'm getting accolades uh, about my recovery and how amazing it is. So my plan needs to be a plan for how do I stay together and grow together with the spouse that I might have or most likely hurt so badly. So in this plan, it needs to start with who are the relationships in my life that I need to look at. And so my, my, literally my recovery plan began with making it right with people that I had hurt. Before I ever uh, knew the 12 steps or worked the 12 steps, I made my list, family members, friends, associates, people I'd worked for, people that I had hurt, and I tried to make it right with them. And if you are married, let's just say we're still talking about that couple, uh, no one is more important than your spouse to make it right. And it just might mean that you have to so deeply, richly care about that other person, that you humble yourself so uh, low that you're not seeking acknowledgement or recognition from other people, and you're not talking about how great it's going for you. In fact, you don't need to talk. And I'm encouraging your spouse not to listen to what you say, but to watch what you do. Because people that are sincere and are truly on the recovery road, they have a plan and they're sticking to that plan. When we talk about relapse, you'll see how that all plays in together. Now, I've said it over and over again. Greatest quote ever outside of the Bible is acceptance is the answer to all my problems today. So if I am realistic about the, the future, now that I'm in recovery, I have to accept the fact 
that it's not going to be easy, that it's not going to always go as expected, but I have to accept the fact I need it. I need a plan. So if I'm uh, in trouble, I can go from rationalizing and, and all the things that I say to myself to accepting the need to do something. And once I do that, then I can move into taking the action that I needed. And the whole rest of what we talk, we're going to talk about are the action steps. Um, and it may take somebody who's been through six weeks of treatment, it may take them uh, another three weeks before I can help them see the need for more action. And then once I get the action in place, I'm doing things to maintain uh, and to support all of those benefits that have come about because I've had a plan that I stuck with. Now, triggers and temptations. I need to deal with that up front, first thing. If, um, if I don't know that the second I decide to uh, no longer do something, there's going to be a trigger or a temptation that could just throw me right back into it instantly. You know, a guy with a lust problem who doesn't have filters on his phone is a stupid guy with a lust problem because they're just going to come up and they may trigger you and then now you're clicking on something and pretty soon you're right back where you were and it's as if you had never been in recovery at all. So I need to write down triggers and temptations when I'm helping somebody develop that plan. And first of all, what do I need to do to prevent as many triggers and temptations as possible? Well, in the area of temptation, uh, I need to be reading Bible every day. I need to be filling my mind with God's Word. But triggers, uh, if it's if I'm triggered by things that come up on the phone, if I'm triggered by movies that I'm watching, places that I go, people that I see, then of course I need to avoid whatever triggers that I can. I need to avoid them long enough to get the plan going. So that's why it's so important to ask a person, okay, so uh, what are you going to do about triggers and temptations. When something comes up and it really tempts you or triggers you back into that old way of thinking, what are you going to do? Well, if they don't say, I am going to call my sponsor, uh, then you need to help them see the need for a sponsor. They need that. Okay, so look at the triggers. Ask them to write down uh, what they think some of the triggers might be, what some of the temptations might be, and then once they've written them down, you can help them see some very valuable things to do when they come up. All right, so if we can get them through triggers and temptations that come up long enough to develop the plan, then the plan needs to start with meetings and mentors. Some people literally need to be going to 90 meetings in 30 days. Um, others don't. But meetings should not just be recovery meetings. There are other things in a person's life that may need, require some meetings. For instance, a lot of folks sure get in financial trouble before recovery begins. And so maybe the meeting they need is to get into a financial freedom workshop or something like that. And uh, you are a mentor to them, but they need another kind of mentor, and that's a sponsor. They need one of their peers to be able to come alongside of them, and that person needs to be on call or being willing to be called, uh, and that's part of the plan. I'm going to call Sheila. I'm going to call Bob. Or here's another thing. I'm going to get in my car, and I'm going to go down to the central office where uh, in, in my big city, and I'm going to go sit down and have coffee with some other people that are in recovery. Or I'm going to head over to the church because they've got meetings there. Whatever I need to do, rather than fall right back into where I, were, I was, that's what I'm going to do. It's a plan that when I show it to my spouse as a recovering person, my spouse knows what I'm going to be doing and can watch me do it.
It's hard to find a trusted friend when you're in crisis. Someone who's been there and understands, but who also has the training and skill to give you practical help. Family, friends, and churches want to help, but often they're not equipped to care for those dealing with problems like addiction and pornography and fidelity, anger, or depression. New Life Ministries is here to provide help and hope in life's hardest places. We're not focused on making people feel better. We're focused on helping people do the work that will help them be better. At New Life, we have resources available to help you, like books, DVDs, CDs, workshops, and our network of licensed counselors. If you need help, call 1-800-NEW-LIFE and begin your new life today. Welcome back again. Now, did you recognize some areas where relapse is creeping into the plan? Of course, the plan is not going to work if we're committed to rationalizing our behaviors or minimizing our behaviors or <laughs> ignoring them or denying them. None of that works. In this segment, I'm going to explore some strategies that I've used these to prevent relapse in my own recovery journey, and I think they might benefit you too. You know, if we don't see this as a relapsing problem, then we're going to be surprised when we slip right back into where we were before. And if we think that we're going to go through all of this trauma and then by ourselves, recover by ourselves, we're wrong. That is a direct path to relapse. Let's look at it again. Okay, I used to smoke. I used to smoke and I also, uh, the organization I worked for, uh, put me in charge of a smoking cessation program. And I quit smoking approximately 49.7 times before I ever figured out how to quit smoking. So after failing at quitting smoking so many times, I had to do something more than just quit smoking. So I looked at how did I get back into smoking whenever I would smoke. I worked at a clothing store, everybody smoked, so I did too. But I didn't want to. I was single, still dating, and guess how I would get back into smoking. I would have a date with somebody that smoked, and I didn't smoke. And they'd be over there smoking, and I'd pick up their cigarette package that they had on the table. And, um, you know, this was years and years ago. And I'd hear the crackle of the cellophane around that cigarette pack. And it just did something to me. It changed the way I felt. I was familiar with that. And so pretty soon, you know, I'd be taking one of those things out of that pack and I'd be holding a cigarette. I didn't smoke anymore, but I heard the crackle. Now I got it in my hands and it wasn't going to be long. It was going to be up there touching my lips. And then I would be smoking again. So when I said, okay, it's finally time that I do something that causes me to never smoke again, I said, I'm not going to quit smoking because that's failed me. Here's what I'm going to quit doing. I'm going to quit picking up packages of cigarettes. I am making a commitment to never, ever have a cigarette package in my hand. I will never hear that cellophane crackling from me holding a package of cigarettes. That was my first commitment. My second commitment after I will never touch a package of cigarettes, my second commitment was I will never touch a cigarette again in my entire life. And I'm serious, Steve, you will never touch a cigarette ever, okay? Then there was a third commitment. I will never touch a pack, I will never touch a cigarette, and I will never put a cigarette up to my lips. My lips, will never ever 
have a cigarette in between them. That's my three-point commitment. I stuck with it. Because, see, relapse wouldn't have been me smoking. Relapse would have been me picking up a pack of cigarettes or holding a cigarette. So what we have to do in developing a plan is we have to have a person not be committed, let's, you know, in the case of an alcoholic, I'm never going to drink again. Okay, yeah. Well, that's failed before, hasn't it? Yes, it has. So I need them to take care of themselves better than that by looking at the setups that they have for drinking again, if it's drinking, or the setups for pornography, if that's the problem. And I need them to, to do some things more than just say, I'm not going to drink. Here's, here's something that I could do. I could make a commitment that I'm not ever going to have alcohol in my house again. Okay? Or, in this first five years of my recovery, I'm not going to, maybe there's some time that it's okay. I don't drink, and it doesn't phase me at all for there to be a bottle of champagne in my house or whatever. But, I, but maybe that's my first line of defense is that I'm never going to have that uh, stuff in my house. Maybe uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change uh, playgrounds and playmates, as they say in AA. Maybe I need to not go to some places. Maybe I need to make the commitment I'm not going to go to a bar ever again. I've seen people say, you know, my, well, you know, what I needed to do was go and minister to people in bars. I needed to win them to Jesus. And pretty soon, you know, you were right back drinking again. Or maybe there are some people that right now, at this particular time in my life, uh, I need to not go do stuff with them. I need to change the folks I'm working with or playing with, having fun with. That's the kind of protection I need to be sure is in place. So the first, next part of my plan is, what are my commitments that I'm not going to do? You help the person. What are the commitments you're going to make so that you're not setting yourself up for failure? All right. Now, beyond the whole addiction thing, what am I going to do, or what are you going to help a person do to take care of themselves? We need to look at nutrition. Uh, because, I mean, one of the great uh, treatment programs in Seattle, Washington, I mean, it was all about uh, nutrition. And you'll see uh, treatment programs say to a person, well, you know, don't worry about your smoking right now or your coffee drinking right now. We're just going to focus on your alcohol or the drug or whatever. I think that's a mistake because a person is never more motivated and inspired to do something than when they get into treatment. And so... This treatment center said, we're going to take care of it all. So they didn't serve coffee with caffeine that, you know, the mood would spike and then the downturn. They didn't have a lot of sugar around there either. So the blood sugar wouldn't go up and then drop. Uh, th they didn't let people smoke. And so if you had a hard time uh, not smoking, that was the great, greatest place ever to deal with it. And so we want to help people deal with the stuff beyond um, the addiction. But to begin with, we really have to see the need to take care of all things in their life that make them healthier. That self-care is that priority. So if I'm not um, looking at nutrition, if I'm not looking at exercise, I need to be taking care of this body. And, you know, the older you get, the more muscle deterioration there is. So I need to be sure I'm building strength and I'm stretching. Uh, I'm doing stretching exercises. Uh, I'm building my cardio. All of those things need to be part of a plan. I can't just be sitting around watching television as part of my recovery program or my recovery plan. In fact, to really take care of myself, I need to develop a routine that I stick with, and it really helps me. My routine over a week needs to be, these are the meetings that I'm committed to that I'm going to go to. So that's my routine. Here are the other kinds of uh, meetings or 
groups that I'm going to be with other than addiction. Here's my Bible study I'm going to go to. Here's the church service that I'm going to. Or like for me, here's my ADHD group that I'm going to be uh, looking at. And, you know, maybe I went before, but if I was drunk, I couldn't benefit from it. So I'm going to look at a routine over a week that says, here's my routine meeting-wise. But then I need a daily routine. And that daily routine needs to begin with God's Word. My routine is I'm going to give myself enough time in the morning. And I always think the morning is a great time to do the exercise stuff. But I'm going to start with Bible reading. Maybe I'm going to uh, not only just uh, look at my Life Recovery Bible. Maybe I'm going to do the one-year Bible. Maybe I'm going to read a devotional out of the Life Recovery Bible. Whatever it is. But my routine needs to be godly uh, truth as the foundation for everything that comes about. Now, why, why would that be important to be part of my routine? Because everything that we do... It's all about the spiritual dynamic that we're experiencing in our life. And if we're not growing spiritually, if we're not taking care of the soul, if we're not looking at, you know, fact is, um, addiction has some uh, very, very serious physiological consequences. And those produce some very psychological symptoms that will only be remedied with a spiritual solution. The 12 steps, it's a spiritual program. And so that's why every day my routine needs to start with the spiritual rather than physical, emotional, whatever. Get the truth in you and then get that body moving uh, so that you've got a foundational routine every day. And that, and then you know, what, what else is in my routine? Is it I take uh, every two hours, I take time to just take a two-minute, three-minute break, kind of reset, refocus? I need a routine that works for me. And it needs to be all about the spiritual dimensions of life. And I'll see you next time. Welcome back. Well, I sure hope that something that's been shared here is going to help you deal with the stuff beyond your addiction. And if you need help with anything, you call us 1-800-NEW-LIFE. And thanks for joining us again. We are so grateful that you're here. And I sure hope to see you next time. God bless. And um, hey, stay in recovery. Don't relapse. Thanks for joining us for Life Recovery Today with Stephen Arterburn. We hope this program has helped you integrate God's truth and wisdom into your recovery journey. This program is brought to you by New Life Ministries, and it's your support that keeps this program on the air. When you contact us for any reason, be sure to let us know that you watch on NRB. Call us at 1-800-NEW-LIFE or go to liferecoverytoday.net. Please join us again next week for more Life Recovery Today.